Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. This is typically where I set the episode up by talking about emerging threats and new stats that support an uptick in certain types of attacks or black hat organization activities. And while I'll continue to do that when it makes sense, I feel like the case has been made as to why protecting industrial control systems has to be a high priority and not just for manufacturers. As we continue to see an increase in attacks targeting the ICS, it's about more than just the industrial sector creating cyber defense plans, cataloging connection points, and shoring up vulnerabilities. The reality is that it's going to take a communal effort to keep manufacturing, the largest single contributor to our country's GDP, safe and secure. As we've learned from a legacy of attacks spanning the last decade, the tactics used and organizations behind them continue to evolve and will need some help in order to prevent and respond to attacks that impact the livelihoods of thousands up and downstream of the initial intrusion. Before we talk to our guests for this episode, we're excited to announce that Security Breach is being sponsored by Rockwell Automation. For more information on their cybersecurity solutions, you can go to rockwellautomation.com. So with the idea of identifying partners looking to support industrial cybersecurity, it's my pleasure to welcome Kimberly Cornwell to Security Breach. As an applications engineer at Siemens, which is one of the largest industrial automation components and technology suppliers in the world, she can offer some insight on how the industrial community is working to meet new and evolving industrial cybersecurity challenges. So Kimberly, thanks so much for joining us here today. I guess we'll start off by saying, you know, manufacturing, uh, the industrial sector, the secret's kind of out there and from a hacking perspective, people are aware of the opportunities that are available in coming after the industrial sector. It has, there's really two schools of thought in terms of is the rise in activity here based on the fact that people are targeting manufacturers or are they just probing for soft spots and they're finding a lot of them within this within this sector. What have you seen on your end in working with manufacturers? Are they being targeted or are they just simply open to more vulnerabilities? I, I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think there are some toolkits um, like Pipeline that are out there for exploit toolkits, basically, that make the barrier to entry to hacking into an OT system a lot easier than it used to be. Um, but I also think there's more reporting and things like Stuxnet and, okay, that was a while ago, but it's still, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, there's been movies, there's been documentaries, there's been books written about it. So knowing that these things exist and are out there um, make them juicier targets. But also I think more things are getting online, so they're more vulnerable than they used to be. You know, it used to be that very rarely would a machine be connected to the outside world, and now everybody's connecting them to the outside world. And, you know great. We now have all these <laughs> wonderful, you know, I mean, there's some some definite benefits to having everything connected to the outside world, but it also introduces some vulnerabilities. And I mean, it, it you know, it doesn't take a lot to shut down manufacturing. Yeah. And I, I think the, <clears throat> the overwhelming thought is too, they've been successful. There's been a lot of positive, I guess you could say from the hacking perspective, a lot of momentum there. When you look at Colonial Pipeline, JBS, we recently talked about Dole Foods and there's been a, a bunch of others that maybe weren't mentioned in the headlines as much, but have been successful sort of in the blacks, the dark side of things in the black hat community. And in looking at that, you know, Siemens is in a really unique position in that they're a very um, well-known, highly recognized provider of automation, both components and systems, as well as software. So from your perspective and in working with that sector and offering those types of products, um, what are you seeing in terms of the, some of the issues that are that are coming to the forefront? During the pandemic, everybody was investing more in automation and implementing a lot more stuff. But we know that the products aren't necessarily the issue, but during implementation, cybersecurity issues can arise. What are you seeing in working with manufacturers in terms of identifying vulnerabilities and maybe putting things in place to, to shut down the bad guys? Um, it, again, it is a mixed bag. Different manufacturers and different sectors are more aware of the vulnerabilities and are staying on top of them better and have teams in place and you know, have plans. Um, others, you know, if I go in and I'm like, you need to put a password on the PLC, they cringe. Um, so it, it's kind of all over the map as to 
where people are in their journey and how vulnerable they think they are. I mean, I wouldn't have, you know, if you'd asked me if meatpacking was a place where I would have been like, oh, you know, I think you're really vulnerable. I probably wouldn't have been like, oh, yeah, you know, everybody's going to be aiming for you. That wouldn't have been, a, you know, what I would consider a high priority target. Um you know, there are some regulations coming down in place in the U.S. that I think are going to implement some regulations and, and need um, within the electrical grid, within municipal water facilities and things like that. So I'm, I'm hopeful. <laughs> but there are so many players and so many actors and there's so much that has proliferated and these products last a really long time and they work really well without any intervention. So people have, you know, they're in, you know, the dark corner of your wear and you may not be aware of how old it is, what it's doing, how it's connected. Maybe the OEM has a connection into it so that your IT knows nothing about, you know, and yeah. during COVID, a lot of things were remote, you know, so people could remote into facilities to do service, um, to take care of machines because they couldn't get into the plants anymore. Um, a lot of those things are still open. I, I am surprised, you know, as a Siemens employee, I am obviously given some access that maybe other people are not given. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you're given access and you're like, great, I can help them out, get them over the hump, whatever their their problem happens to be. But, you know, I can go back two months later and that access is still there. I, I can still access that machine. They haven't shut that down. And that's worrisome to me is that, you know, we've had all these integrators and outside partners coming into plants to take care of things during COVID, which was great because we had to keep manufacturing, they couldn't go in and visit, but nobody really kept a tight lid on, you know, did we close those doors down after they left the building? Um, yeah. So I, I think that there are going to be some pain points in the future with that. So, um, but again, you know, there's, there's good and evil. So I, uh, you know, it's, it's always that kind of that, that pull that, you know, Star Wars type, you know, you can use the force for good or you can go and use it for evil type things. So. Absolutely. You, know, you bring up a couple of really interesting points here. Maybe we can take these one by one. The first sort of being this, this prevailing mindset in the industrial sector and with throughout manufacturing that says, I'm not a big enough deal. I'm not that important. But what we're seeing is these hits on places you mentioned like JBS, it doesn't just affect their operation. It affects a lot of people up and downstream, which again, I think makes manufacturing a very interesting target for the bad guys. What are you seeing there? Do you have any experience in sort of trying to get over that mindset and get manufacturers to realize, hey, folks, you got to pay attention to this stuff too. You are a viable target. And you know, again, it, it varies. Yes, there are definitely industries that are receptive to this. They want, you know, they want to make sure they've got the latest firmware, that they're patched, that they are on top of anything, that they are, you know, monitoring for changes. They have locks on their, you know, any open ports. They've disabled ports. They've put passwords in place. You know, they have bought into, I, I am vulnerable. And we need to, we need to, you know, do what we can. Um, and then there are other places, like you said, that are like, I'm, you know, nobody's going to go after my palletizer, you know, what, yeah. what's exciting about that? Um, but could that, you know, if that palletizer went out, would that shut their whole production line down? It would. And how long would it take for them to get it back up and running? Yeah. You know? Have you come across any type of messaging that sort of helped reinforce the need that it is important to pay attention to all these things? Um, you know, I think the more news that comes out about um, attacks, and I think, you know, you know, the messaging on the plant floor has to be that there's a benefit. So, you know, if I'm an operator of a machine, I want to know that that machine 
hasn't been hacked, that there's, you know, nobody suddenly going to be like, turn all the outputs on, um, you know, (laughs) and do something bad like that. So, and I also think if they do implement cybersecurity measures that the operators can't be dinged for productivity loss. If, you know, if whoever has the key to the passwords happens to be out, I mean, obviously there should be a better plan than a single person having the keys to the passwords, but, you know, if it takes 10 minutes longer to get into the machine, that person shouldn't be dinged for that particular incident. And I I think that's a new mindset. I think production is always like production, 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 and not so much, okay, you know, we lost 10 minutes here, you know, but we kept our, you know, we know our product safe, we didn't kill anybody, you know, no sewage was released into the street, the traffic lights are still operating, all of that type of stuff. So I think it is more just really presenting it, not just coming from the top down, but giving the guys on the floor and the women on the floor, you know, the power to say things. Um, Because a a lot of times the operators will know the vulnerabilities of the machine more than the upper management will. Mm -hmm. You know, they will, they will know where those ethernet cables are going. And if an integrator has outside access that they've allowed in, they're going to be more aware of that. And if, if they're part of the team that's securing the facility and they have buy-in at that level, I think it goes much smoother than when it's pushed down, you know, all of those things. But I also just think just general awareness I don't know how many times I'm allowed to wander around and nobody stops me from pressing any buttons on an HMI. You know, Uh, I'm, I'm a button presser, (laughs) 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 Um, you know, and, you know, hopefully I don't do anything bad, but, you know, and I'm not going in with, you know, a mindset of doing something bad, Um, but nobody stops me. Like, nobody's like, what are you doing? You know, open with this door open and, you know, you have your computer connected and, you know, nobody, nobody questions that. Like they just, you know, and most back doors, if I go in through the shipping receiving area, I can typically get into most plants. Um, Wow. And even going through the front door, rarely do they ask for ID. Yeah. Starts with a lot of the blocking and tackling stuff. A lot of the simple stuff can go a long way. Yeah, I I mean, I think some of those simple, you know, barriers in place, checking IDs, making credentials going in, you know, if you are making a modification, is somebody checking what that modification is? I mean, one of the easiest ways to ransomware a PLC is for me to put a a password in and walk away Um, or to put it in stop and put a password in and walk away. So if they don't have a backup, of the source code or something like that, um, you know, I've left them with a nice little brick. So (laughs) obviously I'm talking facetiously, you know, I I am not going out and doing this, but I mean, these are are very easy ways to to do harm with very little effort um, these days. Well, I mean, Stuxnet, you mentioned earlier, that that started in a lot of cases, or it was used in a lot of applications with just a plug-in USB drive, is how that, that actually proliferated quite a bit outside of its initial entry into uh, the ICS. I'd agree 100%. It really is a cultural issue in a lot of cases, just helping employees to become more aware. You mentioned nobody likes doing the double-factor authentication every time they log in, but I think if there's a little bit of education behind the reasons why, or to understand why when you come into the building, hey, it's okay to check somebody out and ask them what they're doing, because like you said, you could stop by, slip a USB into, into an HMI, and all of a sudden, those machines and potentially more is going to be shut down for a long time. It's also a real easy entry point into a lot of other areas because everything within the plan is becoming so much more connected. So, yeah, I think just a general awareness and, and really paying attention to that human factor is going to be so important going forward. You know, another thing you alluded to or in, in the past, and something that's come up a lot lately is really security by design. With a lot of the different components that are being implemented, Siemens in particular offers a lot of different higher speed drives, a lot of VFDs and things like that that can help improve operational performance. In your experience, or maybe what just some general thoughts or comments on, 
it's great. You can design the components and the systems to be secure, but then you get to that implementation process. That's where some of these security gaps really pop up. Maybe from either experience or just some of your own thoughts there. How do we reinforce or take that security by design out of the package, so to speak, and onto the plant floor? Um, I, you know, I think it's training. I, I think yeah. it's, you know, even as a Siemens employee, I'm I'm on our security, um, cybersecurity team. So if I am showing the code or I'm giving samples of code. There will be a P, there will be a password in my PLC. There will be a password on the project. I will share that with the customer, but I will have implemented. And in the past, we didn't necessarily do that. So now, now we are trying to show by you know show by example, basically. So, you know, before we would be like, oh, you know, we'll turn all that off, and you know, yes, yeah. Mr. Manufacturer, when you implement this, you need to turn this all back on, but for speed and, you know, so that anybody can look at the code. I, I want, I don't want to lock it down. Um, now we're taking a different approach when we do our classes and um, and when we're showing things to customers, we're typing in our password. We're showing, you know, hey, okay. It took all of one second for me to type in my password to get into yeah. the project. You know, those types of things, you know, download to the PLC. Um, so I, th I think it is leading by example. You know, at least the opt-in right now is for security um, and you have to opt out of it yourself. So. Which is a shift, shift in mindset, which I think is definitely going to be helpful going forward. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, I do worry about some of our legacy, you know, there's out in the world, there's just a lot of Modbus and encrypted Modbus is just not, you know, we can do it, um, but I don't see it being done. So right. <laughs> um, like th some of those protocols, those old legacy protocols that are out there um, concern me. Um, and I don't see... You know, okay, my PLC can talk encrypted Modbus, but you know, whatever I'm trying to talk to you can it handle the encryption. Exactly. And that's kind of right now where a lot of things can't handle that. Um, so the PLCs and the computers have the capability, but do the end devices themselves have the ability to handle that and do the handshaking and handle the certificates and and all of that? And um so I, I hope to see more of that coming in the future. Um, yeah, absolutely. Those encrypted handshakes are going to become more and more important. And when they're not there, they're just not turned on, like you said. I mean, that's what the hackers are going after. They're finding those weak connection points and, and taking advantage of it. Speaking of some of those bad actors, is there anybody that's on your radar screen right now, people that Siemens are really paying attention to in terms of groups? Or you mentioned Pipe Dream before, which is a kind of a worm type software. Anything else that you're seeing as specific threats that maybe, like I said, getting a little more attention right now? I don't, you know, I'm sure there are some threat actors that we're concerned about. Um, you know, I'm not going to name any particular groups. I think right now, a lot of our concern um, and the concern within industries are some of the state actors, you know, getting into our electrical grid or um, you know, stealing particular production information needed to make, you know, I don't know, chips or airplanes or drones sure. or what, it, you know, whatever, whatever the devices happen to be. Um, more than, you know, malicious ransom me type where, you know, um, yeah. more with the threat of either they want the intellectual property knowledge of how to manufacture something, or they are looking to, you know, do a very criminal, you know, yeah. nationwide attack of our systems. So I think, I, I think that's probably where I at least have the most concern right now. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about some of the things Siemens is doing to help support manufacturers in their cybersecurity efforts. Yeah, so we have a lot of different layers and a lot of different um, players within the cybersecurity field. So, um, you know, 
we have our product cert, our semen cert, we have our networking people, we have people that'll go and do risk assessments, um, we have our IT group, I, you know, we have many, many layers, um, our Regacom group, um, but there is a holistic approach that Siemens is taking from our design and also for our consulting. So as we go out and our services that we offer um, to really kind of blank, you know, we understand the risks. We, we are a manufacturer as well. So, <laughs> um, you know, we, we make our parts. So um, we understand that particular area of it. You know, we're just as vulnerable as any other plant. Um, you know, but because we all have that knowledge, we can also help apply that and help, you know, give best practices to, to other manufacturers to help them, you know, we're developing a charter of trust. I mean, everyone wants to, you know, become Fort Knox. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow, gradual process. Um, but it is a continuous process and it has to be an evolving process. And that I think is where the OT floor struggles with because we're yeah. so used to, you bought a piece of machinery and it runs for 20 years, 20 plus years. Um, and you just let it go. Yeah. It's interesting. I like the way you kind of brought that up as continuous improvement. I mean, that is something that manufacturers know all about. When we talk about evolving, that's almost a different mindset, if you will. And that's really, if we look at cybersecurity on the plant floor, that's what it is. It's continuous improvement projects, just like any other efficiency laden process that you might have, applying those same principles can work here because you're going to identify some of those new vulnerabilities, understand or some of those weaker connection points. It's a great Great idea, great concept to put forward. You know, you've mentioned it a couple of times too, and I'd love to get your thoughts. In manufacturing, IT and OT, they in some instances still have these silos built around them and they just don't talk to each other like we would think they should or they could. Either from personal experiences or just your general thoughts, how are we doing there? Is manufacturing getting better at sort of talking to each other from the IT and OT side or are those silos just as strong as they've ever been? The silos are still pretty strong in most organizations. <laughs> yeah. um, the plant floor really does not like their IT department, and the IT department really doesn't understand what's on the OT side. Um, you know, they're like, you know, oh, you want another static IP, you know. <laughs> right. Um, and a lot of times they don't even know all the laptops that are involved or, you know, it, and it's it is really sad because we really need those two to to become friends. Yep. <laughs> um, we really need them to work together with Industry 4.0 and all the IoT and you know machine learning and AI and data going up into the cloud. I need that IT. I need those IT people in place. Um, I need them to buy into what you know, the potential of what we're doing, but also the risk. And I need their knowledge to protect us um, because the OT, this isn't necessarily something that OT thinks about that often, you know, we're more, more concerned. Okay, great. I've got this new little toolkit. Um, how can I, how can I use it? Um, you know, it's going to help my production. It's all great and wonderful. Um, and I, you know, not necessarily in in the forefront is cybersecurity all the time. So it's more like, oh, there's a new new widget. We're going to increase our productivity. There's going to, you know, AI is going to solve all our problems. Um, and, you know, sometimes the rush to adopt some of that is is opening up new vulnerabilities. I'm I'm very excited about machine learning and AI as well, um, but I'm really going to need the IT department of these facilities to to help orchestrate it in a cybersecurity manner because um, definitely data is now flowing yeah. all over. <laughs> There's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> data is everywhere now. Um, I mean, it's just flying in the ether around us um, and. Yeah, so it's it, it's 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 an interesting time. It kind of feels like the Wild West a little bit sometimes. Yeah. But um, yeah, I wish the IT and the OT would would join forces um, because IT know has amazing information and has amazing toolkits. Um, 
and the OT, they also, you know, they have amazing knowledge and toolkits as well. But if they could merge and come together as a team, it'd be a much more powerful story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hopeful. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting, too. Because what we're seeing on the OT side is trying to sort of do a cut and paste approach with some of those IT security approaches or tools and it just doesn't work the same the firewalls need to be different the encryption needs to be different than purely from an it perspective we're also seeing sort of a lack of expertise on the ot side in a security realm so finding somebody who can really fill that position that has a working knowledge of what is needed from a security as well as from an operational perspective is probably one of the biggest challenges going forward really for for manufacturing yeah um, i would i would agree with that because most OT people have kind of risen from the floor and, and exactly. not necessarily come from an IT space. Um, a few have, but generally it's been more of a homegrown, you know, they've picked it up on the side or, you yeah. know, because they had to, um, you know, but yeah, so it, it's definitely there is a lack of knowledge out there. Um, and, and there's just a general lack of knowledge of what is on the floor. <laughs> Yeah. Um, just following the wires, you know, Ethernet is everywhere. Um, got wireless, you've got modems, you know, cells that have been thrown in by an OEM so that they can access their machinery. I mean, there's just, you know, when you start opening the doors of things and start following the wires, it it's it it's frightening a little bit. <laughs> It's impressive, and but yeah, scary. It, it, it's, I you know, it keeps everything going. But like, if you ask, like, for a network map at most plants, you're not, you know, you, yeah. it's kind of like you get the deer in the headlight looks, and you're like, okay, this is going to be a fun job. Uh, <laughs> or even worse, you're asked, why would you need that, right? Why, why do you need that for? So. Yeah. So, an isolation of networks and southbound, northbound, and kind of, you know, I, I mean, I always like if I go into a plant and I'm like, oh, you know, if I'm going to plug my computer into the switch, you know, is anybody from your IT going to come screaming because they're going to see this yeah. bizarre computer and they're like, oh, no problem. I'm like, oh, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Or, you know, I'm going to do a wire shark because anybody, you know, is anybody going to know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and things just as simple as blocking pings, you know, everyone's like, oh, can you ping it? You know, I'm like, well, do, should you be able to ping it? Do I want you to be able to ping it? I want you to know what that IP is because that makes it that much harder for the, you know, whoever has to get in, if they can just put in pings, you know, they'll eventually yeah. find a device. Um, if, if I actually, if I can't ping something, that's actually beneficial sometimes. So I mean, it's, it's a tough call. <laughs> well, it sort of gets back to that mindset, right, of everybody being aware of what could happen. We understand how we've always done things, but we are in a new age now in understanding all these things before, which were harmless, now can be a huge deal and, and really impact the, the entire enterprise on a much bigger level, one that we've never really anticipated before. So. Yeah. And I mean, I wish um, industry would share their best practices. So I also wish they would share when it goes wrong. Um, we don't often hear about incidents unless it does do something public or, you know, I mean, a lot of things happen in-house, you know, and this has always happened. There's always been malicious sabotage, things that have happened within plants. Um, and And it doesn't make the news, but you know, if there were some way of like a Reddit community of just, um, mm -hmm. you know, invisible people telling their stories so that others could hear and learn from them. So, you know, best practices, what's worked, you know, how do we get the buy-in from our plant floor? How do we get to be friends with our IT department? How did we, you know, how do we slowly incorporate cybersecurity and cyber hygiene as just a fact of life in our plant, like how, you know. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. It's one of the things I've talked about on the show a lot. You know, how do we share that information, share it about the hack, share best practices without glorifying the hacker? You know, a lot of times in the headline, then that's where the, the public interest goes, or it's in blaming somebody 
let's get past all that, share the information and, and just get more secure going forward. Uh, couldn't agree more. So Kimberly, kind of wrapping stuff up here, looking forward a little bit, are there any big trends that you're seeing sort of coming down the pike? Um, you know, I, I do think artificial intelligence, machine learning, a lot of data, a lot, a lot of data being produced right now. <laughs> um, you know, a, a lot of tools, you know, chat GPT, you're seeing people program their PLCs with that now. And, and it, you know, doing, you know, talking to their HMI and doing all sorts of language learning. And I, I mean, some of it's very exciting. Some of it's just kind of novelty stuff. Um, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. You know, but I do think um, data is going to be our new currency. And so, you know, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see how we go forward with it. Um, but a lot of data is leaving the plant floor. A lot of data that used to be really tightly held, you know, Bush's baked beans, their secret recipe. Not, 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 I don't work with Bush's baked beans, but their secret recipe could be out in the cloud right now. Um, sure. So, um you know, those types of things. So it's it's going to be interesting. Um, it's exciting times. I, I think manufacturing is much more tech forward than it's been, um, yep. which is, is great, but also a little scary because we, we, we're not even doing the good cybersecurity right. at, at, at what they have right now. So now opening this Pandora's box of new tools, which are much more exposed, um, not necessarily, but can be much more exposed. And if they have, mm -hmm. haven't been used to thinking about the cybersecurity implementations, my fear is that they're rushed to, yeah. to implement some of this stuff. They're going to, you know, be like, oh, we'll go back and we'll, we'll take care of the security at a different time. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll make our certificates good for 20 years, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, things like that. So um, that's kind of where I, I get a bit concerned, excited, um, sure. really excited for, for where manufacturing is going. I, I think there's a lot of, of good coming out, um, but would like us to get some of the fundamentals of good cybersecurity Um at the base level, at the plant floor right now, before we start going, oh, yay, here we go. Um, yeah. But it's it's what keeps us all employed, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think everybody would agree there's been a little too much ready, fire, aim type of mentality when it comes to a lot of these new automation and plant floor technologies. You know, you mentioned artificial uh, intelligence, and that's come up in a lot of conversations about cybersecurity. And well, you could see it going both ways. It, it will be really interesting to see how that plays out. There's a ton of opportunity to enhance what we're doing now, but the bad guys know that too. So how are they going to counter that? Because you mentioned chat uh, GPT. Boy, you could see that used in a whole mess of, of bad ways too. So it yeah, will be interesting no, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. I mean, I, I love technology. So I, you know, I'm excited about this particular aspect of it, but I, I do think we sometimes have to rein in a little bit and, and, you know, make sure we're making some fundamental, you know, sometimes I think we jump on the bandwagon of, oh, new technology, um, you know, and a lot of, you know, a lot of companies have been collecting data for a long time. They've had the data. They've never looked at their data. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and now they're yeah. like, let's send it out and, and AI will will suddenly see trends in our data. And I'm like, well, you've had the data all this time and you've never even looked at it. So maybe if you had a human look at it first, you might see some patterns in it before, <laughs> you know, necessarily we need to send it elsewhere um, yeah. to be looked at. But I, I mean, that's just, um, you know, and then you also have the staunch manufacturing floors that you know, new technology is verboten, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, we're going to live and die and, you know, we use punch cards till, um, <laughs> you know, until the end of time. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a wide mix that you see across the different industries where they oh, are sure. in that particular, you know, whatever people are calling industry 4.0 or whatever, you know, whatever mm -hmm. the term we're using right now um, for the period that we're in. So you always have early adopters and then you have people that are a little slower to adopt and 
Yeah. And but it's it's exciting. I'm it's it's fun. New technology is always <laughs> um yeah. Keeps it interesting. It keeps it it does keep it very interesting. So it's it's all just still zeros and ones, but it's Excellent. Kimberly, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to catch up a little bit more on some of the work um, Kimberly and her colleagues are doing, you can check them out at Siemens.com. So, Thank you, Jeff. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity story or topic that you'd like to have us explore on Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at For Kimberly Cornwell, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.